The thesis is that there is something seriously wrong with the scientific review process, that the process of reviewing papers, of getting criticism back from referees, of trying to get your paper published in decent journals, has become, if not outright broken, at least distorted to the point where it's hindering people's careers instead of helping them and producing more problems than it is solving problems. If that thesis is correct, and I think the members of the panel will offer a persuasive argument than it is, it is not because journals have become poisonous or because editors have become incompetent. It is because we as scientists, the people responsible for the reviewing process, have forgotten how it's supposed to work and perhaps have reached a point in the evolution of the scientific enterprise where it can no longer work the way it once did but is not working properly now. For me, I think the key functions of peer reviewers is to advise editors both on the technical and conceptual merits of a paper. So um, they are the experts in the field who provide editors with feedback on both how the experiments are done and where they stand in the field with respect to what else has already been known. The editor is the person who sets the vision for the journal um, and the editorial standard for the journal and ensures that that's kept standard across papers in different fields and in different areas. So they're the person who sees all of the papers that come into a journal and they also see all of the reviews that come into a journal and are in a position to sort of equilibrate both across fields and across reviewers to make sure that there's a consistency. Reviewers, on the other hand, typically see a small subset of the papers and they're judging based on their experience as scientists and their perspective on the technical aspects of the paper but they don't, in the end, set the criteria for what a journal should publish. They're, they're as advisors to the editors. The piece I wrote now two years ago made a few points about uh, the tyranny of reviewer experiments. A key point, I think, is uh, for reviewers to review what's in front of them and not by proxy raise the bar on behalf of the journal. Uh, this leads, I think, to a colossal waste of money, time, and energy for experiments that don't usually materially affect the conclusions of the original manuscript. The consequence of this, this uh, lack of confidence, which I think is one of the traits, is uh, endless rounds of re-review, uh, an unwillingness to make decisions on the merits of the rebuttal, and go back time and again to reviewers, solicit yet other reviews, such that you know, from the time of initial submission to final acceptance, a period of one year elapsing is not an exception. I think that's unacceptable. All the more so where you know, the research monies that we spend are not ours. It's uh, the famous taxpayer money or it's the charities that donate money not to get papers published in Cell instead of some other journal, but to get the, to get the question answered. Well, I think the journal in which papers are published is a very good indicator of the quality of the research. The problem uh, comes because it isn't a perfect indicator. And uh, there are two problems, really. One is that, of course, there's noise in the system. And some superb papers are rejected uh, from the highest prestige journals. Um, and some papers that are perhaps uh, not going to uh, stand the test of time are published in those journals. Um, that kind of noise wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for the fact that there's a huge nonlinearity. That is, the, the benefit to an author of being published in the highest prestige journals is many fold that of being published in, in a uh, lower prestige journal. And I'm, I'm not naming names for obvious reasons, but everybody watching this video knows what I mean. So the upshot is that somebody whose paper was 98% uh, good enough to get into a prestige journal and goes down uh, to the next tier journal uh, is not going to get a job, is not going to get invited to conferences, um, is not going to get a grant. And so because of this nonlinearity, the sort of hierarchy of journals has an effect that's completely disproportionate uh, to the real difference in quality of the papers that uh, are published. And certainly, I think I do think there are inefficiencies with the current model of peer review. Um, I think that's true of any system, and I think it's important that we look for what those inefficiencies are and try and identify ways to improve them. Um, I don't, you know, it's a hard task to come up with um, ways to improve the efficiencies that preserve the value and quality of peer review. But certainly, 
I do think there are inefficiencies, um, and we shouldn't give up looking for ways to make the system better. Uh, if you're talking about a solution that doesn't actively involve, say, a cattle prod, then I think the best thing that can be done is, uh, is not any one thing, but a set of things. So first of all, I think editors need to have more backbone. They need to be sufficiently empowered to say, this review is unreasonable, this part of this review is unreasonable, if you do this and the reviewer is not, still not satisfied, I'm going to be satisfied, even if the reviewer is not. Editors have to take more control of the process. I think we as senior scientists have to train junior scientists in the proper way of reviewing. We, we have to take a more active role in mentoring our postdocs and our junior colleagues in the way we expect reviews need to be conducted so that the reviewing process gets to where it has to go. I think those two things would make very big differences. I think there are a lot of other smaller things that also could be done. For example, we could give specific instructions to reviewers forbidding certain types of reviews, saying we're not interested in reviews that would take this project to a completely new level. We're not interested in a review that says, okay, you've done it in Drosophila, now you have to do it in worms or mice. We want you to review the paper as written. And if you don't review the paper as written, we'll discard your review, and you're not going to get another chance to review. I think we can do this uh, as, as a community in the journals that we have some control over. We do have a problem that there are journals over which we have no control. That's going to be a separate matter. I think that would be helpful. I think, to be honest with you, the process would get better if we did away with certain things, if the impact factor were sent to hell where it belongs and told to stay there, that would make a big difference. There are a bunch of other things like that we could do. Having an open peer review process does ease some of the issues in terms of how, when an editor has to intervene. In all cases, I think an editor has to play a role intervening when a review process starts to become more antagonistic rather than uh, supportive and, and constructive. Uh, it's pretty easy to see when that happens because you can sense in the way the letters are written between reviewers and authors an escalating sense of, of anger. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all peer review process. And a lot of people are trying to change the peer review process so that it's the same across the board for every journal. And I don't think that that is appropriate because research differs from field to field and different things are needed in order to assess that. And the way editors look at papers require um, a different way of, of interacting with authors and reviewers.